straight ahead on Law and Crime Daily. The defendant kills witnesses. After weeks in court, closing arguments begin in the trial of real estate heir Robert Durst. Hear from the prosecution team who say Durst has spent his life running from the truth. Plus, new developments for the Free Britney movement as Britney Spears' father petitions to be removed from her conservatorship. Our legal experts explain what that can mean for the pop star. And we're hearing from Bill Cosby accuser Andrea Constan for the first time since the comedian was released from prison. How she says his release has affected her. But first, newly released text messages pop up in the wake of Elizabeth Holmes' opening statements. I think these text messages are going to be really helpful to the prosecution and difficult for the defense to overcome. What the texts say and why they may contradict the defense's arguments. Law and Crime Daily covering court cases from coast to coast. Welcome everyone to Law & Crime Daily. I'm Brian Buckmeyer along with Terry Austin. As the trial for Theranos founder Elizabeth Holmes begins in California, new text messages come to light that could undercut her defense. Law & Crime's Anjanette Levy is here with some of those texts. Elizabeth Holmes is accused of defrauding investors with Theranos' blood testing technology. She also is claiming that she was misled about the technology by her then-boyfriend, Sonny Balwani, and that he abused her. But there are some text messages from 2015 that threaten to undercut that claim. Text messages from May 12, 2015 show that Holmes wrote to Sonny Balwani, you are breeze and desert for me, my water and ocean, meant to be only together, tiger, madly in love with you and your strength. The next day, Balwani wrote, all my love. Attorney Heather Hansen has followed the case closely. Heather, what do you make of these new text messages that came out between Elizabeth Holmes and Sonny Balwani? You know, I always talk about tone of voice being important, Anjanette, but tone of text messages is also <laughs> important. And when you listen to and see these text messages, it is pretty clear from them that the relationship that she describes as being abusive and controlling and all of these things is not there with what we've seen so far. So it depends on how the rest of the text messages come out. But for what I have seen thus far, I think these text messages are going to be really helpful to the prosecution and difficult for the defense to overcome. And that is a major part of her defense, that she was a, an abused woman, that he was, you know, had her under his control and she was naive and didn't know. Yeah, it's funny. It's a new part of her defense, right? It's something that we just found out about recently. And yes, it looks like it's going to be the crux of her defense, that he was abusive physically, emotionally, psychologically, and that as a result, she could not form the intent. She didn't intend to defraud these people, but rather intended to keep him happy. So far, I have not seen any text messages that support that defense. Now, there's things I'm sure we haven't seen, and I anticipate she will take the stand to try to explain some of this away. But what I've seen so far is not great news for the defense. You wrote a piece for lawandcrime.com in which you, you basically said she was able to charm investors. And now you're questioning whether she can charm a jury. Uh, what does Elizabeth Holmes have to do? Well, it's a very, I, I talk all the time about we all have our juries and her jury with the investors was the investors. That's who she wanted to influence and persuade. And here she has an actual jury and they look very different than her investors. Her jury here ranges in age from 19 to 60. She has men and women. She has, um, the majority are Caucasian, but there are some Hispanic jurors. There are a few Asian jurors. All of these people look very different from the investors that she had that tended to be older white men. She needs to talk to them differently. They need to present it differently. They need to look at this case from the perspective of a 19-year-old a, um, all of these various personalities. That's going to be part of how she has to advocate to this jury. Well, very interesting. Attorney Heather Hansen, thanks so much for joining us. And we'll send it back to you in the studio. Thanks, Anjanette. Joining us today is criminal defense attorney Bernarda Villalona and Terry Austin. Bernarda, how are these text messages going to play into this trial? Brian, you know from having trying cases that the, the reality is, is that when you're dealing with text messages, that at the time that you're sending text messages, you're not thinking that you're going to be criminally charged. You're not thinking that these text messages can actually be used against you at the time of trial. So these text messages are going to play heavily against Ms. Holmes, who was able to profit billions of dollars on this so-called technology, and it's not going to work in her favor.
Yeah, she definitely was not thinking about a trial during that whole desert breeze comment. Uh, Terry, in opening statements, the defense led with the prosecution is trying to make out a crime from a failed startup. Do you see that happening, or do you see that based on the facts? Is that what's going on here? Well, I think they're trying to say that, but I don't think that's going to prevail. There's a big difference between a failed startup and fraud. It's okay to have a company that doesn't succeed, but it's not okay. It's a question of ethics to lie to your investors about how the company is doing. She knew all along, at least it does seem that way, that the company was not doing well. You can be optimistic, but you cannot portray that you're making money, that the tests are going well, when in fact, that's not happening. This sounds a little bit like Enron and WorldCom to me, where it was accounting fraud. Here, she basically is trying to tell those investors who have a lot of money and a lot of faith in her that they're all doing well. Please keep investing. So that's the difference. Yeah. I mean, puffery is definitely a type of defense I've heard for fraud. We're the greatest this, we're the best that. When you start saying our devices have been shipped to war zone areas, different places and different medical facilities, that sounds more like fraud. But of course, we'll keep eyes on this case as it continues. New sound into our newsroom. As Bill Cosby accuser Andrea Constant speaks out for the first time since the comedian's release from prison. Cosby was released from prison back in June after serving three of his original 10-year sentence. In 2018, Cosby was convicted on three felony counts of aggravated indecent assault, largely in part to Constant's sexual assault allegations. Constant told NBC News on Tuesday that though Cosby was released, her statement against him was still believed. Well, everybody has is entitled to their own celebrations, but it, it doesn't change the fact that he's a sexually violent predator and he will always be my rapist. There was nothing happy for me about seeing somebody put in handcuffs and put into a van and taken to jail. It's all sad. Lives impacted, families ruined. You can watch Constant's entire exclusive interview courtesy of NBC News. Still ahead on Law and Crime Daily, the Murdoch murder mystery continues after reports of another shooting, South Carolina suspends attorney Alex Murdoch's law license. But first, bombshell news in the free. Hi, this is Dan Abrams with exciting news for all of our Law and Crime followers on YouTube. You can now get the live Law and Crime Network with YouTube TV for all of your daily live trial coverage, legal news, expert analysis, and original true crime programs. Subscribe to YouTube TV today and then locate Law and Crime in the channel guide. And for only $1.99 a month, you can add the network to your bundle. Watch Law and Crime every day with YouTube TV. We put you in the jury box. Welcome back to Law & Crime Daily. Britney Spears' father files a petition to end the pop star's conservatorship. The conservatorship dates back to 2008, following Spears' public breakdown. Since then, her father, James Jamie Spears, has held control of her financial decisions through a legal conservatorship. The conservatorship came to light in recent years through the so-called Free Britney movement, as fans of the singer allege she is being controlled by her father. In the past two years, Britney has attempted to remove her father from the conservatorship, most recently in June of this year, alleging Jamie Spears was abusive and that he ruined her life. Last month, Britney's attorneys filed a petition to remove Jamie Spears and replace him with a professional accountant. In the new document filed Tuesday, Jamie Spears requests removal from the conservatorship, saying Britney is, quote, entitled to have this court now seriously consider whether this conservatorship is no longer required. Jamie Spears has repeatedly denied any abuse towards his daughter. Let's bring back criminal defense attorney Bernardo Villalona and Terry Austin to break down the newest twist in the Spears conservatorship. Terry, hey, it's what Britney Spears wanted all along, but does the timing seem a little suspicious? Well, it may not be suspicious, Brian, but it's definitely convenient. He's stepping down for a number of reasons, not the least of which is Britney wants him to step down. And she has expressed that repeatedly. And then you mentioned the movement trying to free Britney. That public pressure has got to weigh down on him. He has to know as a father that he's the one who the public is considering as the bad guy. And so I think that's part of the reason. Her attorneys think that he's trying to 
avoid the deposition, avoid accounting. And frankly, in my opinion, he should one step down and he should do a full accounting. She has every right to see where her money has been spent. Absolutely. Bernardo, with Jamie asking for a reevaluation of Britney Spears without a psychological exam, could this be the beginning of the end of the conservatorship? So absolutely, Brian, I find it quite interesting that now that Jamie Spears is no longer going to be in charge of the conservatorship, she's like, wait, hold up. Let's evaluate whether my daughter even needs to continue with this conservatorship. Because now that Jamie is out, guess what? He's not receiving thousands of dollars per month in order to manage this conservatorship. So I'm curious to see how this is going to play out. I will say this, that an audit needs to take place for everything that has been done on behalf of Britney Spears while Jamie Spears has been ahead of this conservatorship. Absolutely. An audit would be very interesting to see how those dollars and cents moved, and maybe there's something uh, behind all this smoke. Thank you both. Turning now to more top legal news and an update on the Murdoch murder mystery. South Carolina Supreme Court is suspending the law license of Alex Murdoch. Alex Murdoch is accused of misappropriating funds from his law firm. The attorney made national headlines this summer after he called 911 to report finding the bodies of his wife, Maggie, and their son, Paul, shot dead on the family's hunting property. This weekend, Murdoch again called 911, this time to say he had been shot in the head by a passing vehicle. He's now recovering from his injury, but the South Carolina Supreme Court acted quickly after his firm reported his alleged misappropriation, saying Murdoch is suspended until further notice. He resigned on Monday, saying he was entering rehab. And in Georgia, the former district attorney handling the Ahmaud Arbery case has turned herself in to authorities. Jackie Johnson is charged with violating her oath of office and obstructing and hindering a law enforcement officer. According to the indictment, Johnson let her favor and affection for Gregory McMichael stand in the way of justice. Gregory McMichael, along with his son Travis and co-defendant William Rody Bryan, are accused of gunning down Aubrey while he was jogging in a Georgia neighborhood. Johnson was booked into the Glen County Detention Center Monday morning and released on a $10,000 bond. Coming up on Law & Crime Daily, after months of back and forth, closing arguments begin in the trial of Robert Durst. What you need to know as the prosecution trudges forward in its case against the real estate heir. Plus, the Elijah McClain family attorney speaks to Law & Crime Daily for the first time since the... Welcome back to Law & Crime Daily. We're hearing for the first time from Elijah McClain's family's attorney one week after five first responders were charged in connection to his death. You may remember Elijah McClain was killed back in 2019 when Aurora, Colorado police officers confronted him and paramedics administered ketamine to sedate him. McClain, a 23-year-old black man, was wearing a ski mask at the time and committed no crimes. Just last week, the Colorado Attorney General's office secured a 32-count indictment against the three officers and two paramedics, accusing them of manslaughter and criminal negligent homicide. I sat down with McLean family attorney Mari Newman, who says she's proud to be part of a case that will hold law enforcement accountable. Take a listen. Sure. Well, the day before the indictments were announced publicly, the Attorney General's office, of course, called the family out of uh, courtesy and respect. And, um, and I can tell you about the conversation between the Attorney General's office and Elijah's dad, Luane. Um, as soon as Luane heard the news, he just broke down. This is news he had been waiting for for two years. And so for him, it was, I think, a combination of um, a sense of relief, a sense that finally there was gonna be some measure of accountability. You know. These prosecutions are important, but they don't bring Elijah back. And so for Elijah's dad, you know, it's bittersweet because he still doesn't have his son, but he was thankful to the, to the attorney general's office and to the grand jury for trying to do what is in their power, and that is to hold the officers and the medics accountable. The indictment of these officers and paramedics is just the beginning. This is, I know it's a, it's a huge victory, but it's just hopefully one of many in this case. So what's next, both for the, the civil rights case, but as well as the criminal case against the three officers and two paramedics? 
Well, obviously, from the criminal side of things, they brought the charges, but now they need to prosecute them. And so that, that process will be ongoing. In the context of the civil rights case, that case continues to be ongoing. We're litigating that in federal court. And then there's a uh, third investigation that's happening here in Colorado. I'm very proud to have been part of the team that passed uh, what's really been touted as the most comprehensive police accountability bill since the murder of George Floyd. That's called Colorado SB 217. And one of the things that we did in that law was we empowered the Colorado State Attorney General to conduct investigations into departments that have a pattern or practice of brutality or discrimination. And based on that new law, the Colorado Attorney General also has, has uh, initiated a uh, investigation into the Aurora Police Department, which as you and I discussed last time has a long standing and horrible uh, pattern of both racism and brutality that has gone on for decades. I've been suing them for decades and surely uh, it began long before that. And so that investigation is also ongoing. And my hope is that that will result ultimately in a consent decree, which requires that the Aurora Police Department change in meaningful ways so that no more lives are lost. When we come back, the highly anticipated closing arguments begin in the trial of Robert Durst. We'll show you how the prosecution blasts the accused murderer and... Welcome back. After four months of testimony, more than three weeks of the defendant on the stand, and a lot, I mean a lot, of patience. Closing arguments finally began in Robert Durst's murder trial. Robert Durst is on trial for the murder of his best friend, Susan Berman, who was discovered dead in her Benedict Canyon, California home in December 2000. Durst is accused of murdering Berman because she supposedly had information about his wife, Kathy, another murder that he's also accused of. Testimony was paused in March 2020 due to the pandemic and resumed in May 2021. Closing arguments began this week with Prosecutor Habib Bailian representing the state of California. He opened the arguments with jokes that jabbed at some of his teammates. Some sighs, and it's hard to tell like if those sighs were more like, oh man, Mr. Bailian's giving the argument. Or like, oh, Mr. Billion's given the argument. <laughs> <laughs> but do not worry. Do not worry. Mr. Lewin gave me a list of some topics he wanted me to cover. So <laughs> I'm joking, of course. Mr. Millius here. I don't know if you remember, but when we started the trial, this is what Mr. Millius looked like. <laughs> After the laughs cleared out of the courtroom, Baylian got down to business, making a strong statement about why the jury is there. Why are we here? Why have we had this trial? It could be anyone. It could be Officer Dean Benner, who he tried to get to the glove box for ID, which we know what ID was in there. That ID was loaded with five rounds of ammunition. It could have been off, it's Officer Dean Benner or me, I had no choice. It could have been it's Catherine Piermetti or me, I had no choice, the loss prevention officer. He also tried to get to that car. It could be anyone who stands between my accountability or me, he has no choice. We're here because he kills witnesses. That's why we've had this trial. The defendant kills witnesses or tries to kill witnesses, or plans to kill witnesses. The state then brought up a bizarre and somewhat jarring image they say sums up Durst's tendency to lie. Trust him when he's admitted to you he lied, and you know that he's lied to you about many things, and you know they're important things, and you know that they would be the things that involve the central issues in this case. Can you trust him? Let me ask you this. Say you go to a restaurant and you order a bowl of soup, and your soup comes. This is gonna be a little gross, but I think it, it adequately illustrates this point. And your soup comes, and this is what you find in it. Do you just pick out that bug, that cockroach, toss it aside, and say, you know what? I'm just gonna finish this soup. This is what was served to you. Literally, you were served a bowl of cockroaches. And you were told, you pick out which ones are bad and which ones are good. 
you toss them aside, but you can trust the rest of that soup. Go ahead and eat it up. Lap it up. Bernardo, you've done plenty of closing arguments. How is the prosecution doing so far? So I think they're doing okay. However, I have to think that, look, this trial has been going on for days, for weeks, for months. So in order to encapsulate everything that has taken place, they have to hit the major points. And I think one point that they have failed to miss in this case is that, look, Robert Thurs, as he sits at the defense table, he looks like he's going to croak over and die any day. They need to remind the jury that when these murders took place, Robert Durst was much younger, much stronger, much, much more expressive during that time than he is today as he sits before you. And I think what the prosecution just needs to continue, continue going with that the case is about the nine words. It was either her or me. They, he had to make a choice, and he made that choice, and just keep hitting that nail on the head so this jury knows that when they go back and deliberate, that even despite the weeks and months of testimony, that this case is very simple. He had to do what he needed to do in order to remain a free man in the streets. Absolutely. Terry, what did you think of this cockroach approach by the prosecution? Can the defense bring up any reasonable doubt after that? I actually think Balian did an excellent job so far, and the cockroach analogy was excellent. If you have a cockroach in your soup, you are not going to eat the rest of it. You're going to send it back because it's tainted and you can't eat any of it, just like you're not going to believe as a jury anything this man has to say. Excellent analogy. He was doing a great job. All right, watch out for cockroaches in your soup, and we'll talk to you later. Thank you for joining us here on Law & Crime Daily. We'll see you next time as we discuss justice in America.